Section 35 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Schirmerhorn. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921, by G. K. Chesterton, Section 35. At the Sign of the World's End, Is the Parent a Paradox, by G. K. Chesterton. A magistrate recently remarked, in reference to some outbreak of petty thievery, I think, that this new lawlessness was due to the loss of parental control, and I think it reasonable, whether the magistrate thought so or not, to say that the loss of parental control is in its turn due to the increase of official control, and this is surely the more natural because it is an increase of official control over parents. The child cannot be expected to treat the parent as a parent, when the rulers of the city do not even treat him as a citizen. This is especially true to the eclipse of the father by the schoolmaster, and this again is especially applicable to the particular moral problem with which the magistrate had to deal. It is stark common sense to say that the sense of private property can be learnt better in a private house than in a public school. The master must at best teach morality mainly in theory, while the mother is obliged to teach it in practice. Neither the tests, nor the temptations, nor the spiritual triumphs of this sort of sense of honor are likely to occur in an official school. No little toddling infant is likely to attempt to carry off a blackboard. He is not even very likely to want to steal a piece of chalk but he is quite likely to want to steal a piece of cheese. He is even more likely to want to steal a piece of chocolate or of toffee. It is unlikely that the average schoolboy will be so madly devoted to his studies as to desire to run away with the map of Europe. It is perfectly possible that the average child in the nursery may wish to snatch a highly colored picture book out of the hand of another average child. It is improbable that the average schoolboy will piratically possess himself of other people's French grammars or books of geometry, though I did once know a boy who stole 27 copies of Hall and Knight's Algebra. But he was not an average schoolboy. He was a very studious, scholarly, and attentive schoolboy. He was also mad. The point here, however, is that if we are going to teach children this antiquated idea of honesty at all, the people who can really teach it with reasonable grip and good nature and sense of proportion are certainly his father and mother. From various letters I have received, I fancy I have rather failed to make plain this platitude about parents. Indeed, the platitude seems actually to be regarded as a paradox. The truth is, as somebody once pointed out very effectively in the New Age, that when very simple things have once ceased to be self-evident to anyone who is sane, they always have to be set out with extreme subtlety by someone who is rather subtle. The present case probably requires somebody who is much more subtle than I am, but since I have made this criticism of the modern view of the family more than once before, both in connection with the modern view of marriage and the modern view of education, I will try once more to explain to my critics and correspondents what I mean. And since I cannot be subtle, I will try to be simple. There are two human relations which modern rulers are everywhere disposed to dissolve. They are the only two relations which ordinary people are so naturally constituted as to desire. 
Indeed, they are the only two relations which are in a direct sense founded on desire at all. It is only in an indirect sense that the human soul can be said to desire a green grocer. Considered as an individual, doubtless the green grocer is a man and therefore a miracle. But in the ordinary sense, we only express our longing for a green grocer as a symbol of our longing for greens. And though we have a relation to greens, it is hardly a human relation. At any rate, it is a rather one-sided relation. If it be so with symbols of commerce like the green grocer, it is still more so with symbols of compulsion like the policeman. There may be moments of crisis and high emotion when we ardently desire a policeman, or even cry aloud for one. But those are not moments of minute intellectual self-analysis, or even of a very fastidious and logical selection of words. At such times, it would probably look like lingering on too fine a shade to insist that we do not, in the ultimate sense, desire a policeman, but only certain results that can only be obtained through a policeman. We do not directly desire the policeman as a thing of beauty, or feel a mysterious happiness in the mere sight of his helmets or his buttons. But a man can desire a woman as a thing of beauty, or a woman can desire a baby as a thing of beauty. And these two relations, that of a man and wife, or mother and child, are the only two recognized combinations found on this natural satisfaction with the thing itself. They are also the only two recognized combinations in capitalist civilization which that system has set out to destroy. It is essential to note that no other relation is really being attacked. There is no real effort to do without the green grocer, even if the green grocer is a profiteer. Peasants do to some extent without the green grocer, because they grow their own greens, but none of these emancipators are trying to create the particular sort of emancipation that belongs to peasants. There is no serious effort to do without the policeman, on the ground that he may be a bully. I am not here arguing that he is a bully, or that I desire to do without him. I am pointing out, as a fact, that there is no particular probability of our curtailing his powers on the possibility of his being a bully. But there has been a marked tendency to curtail the husband's or the parent's powers on the possibility of his being a bully. And this although there is at least something in his case which tends against that possibility being a probability. It is in the ordinary human sense a mere toss-up, an equal chance, whether a green grocer or a policeman is a good man or a bad man. But it is not a pure toss-up or an equal chance whether a mother loves or hates her children. The hatred is in its nature abnormal. In a quarrel between the green grocer and the green grocer's assistant, the right may be on either side, but if the green grocer's conduct is unjust, it need not be unnatural. There is present no natural bias, as in the case of maternity, no original sex attraction, as in the case of marriage. Yet we hear little in the case of capital and labor, except exhortations to promote their interdependence. And we hear little in the case of man and woman, except exhortations to promote their independence. And it is the same with the government official as with the capitalist employer. A coastermonger may knock his wife needlessly about the head, and a policeman may knock the coastermonger needlessly about the head. But it is unlikely that there was ever a time when the policeman went courting the coastermonger with love lyrics in the style of Albert Chevalier, and it is unlikely that the policeman ever had his sleep disturbed 
or his dreams enriched with visions of the moke and the mother of pearl buttons. There is not, and there never has been, any natural attraction or tenderness between a policeman and a coaster monger. Yet we assume that the relations between the coaster and the copper will be all right. While we are more and more assuming that the relations between Mr. and Mrs. Henry Hawkins will be all wrong. Yet it is obvious that in the first case the right may be on one side and the might on the other, while in the second there may be something beyond might and right, which there cannot possibly be in the first. If this principle be true to some extent of husbands and wives, it is yet more manifestly true in the case of parents and children. By the ordinance of nature, the child is from the first in the care of the only people who have normally a bias in his favor. It is possible that he may be badly treated by them, but it is also possible that he may be badly treated by anybody else. By all the people who have not a bias in his favor. Of any of those people, it is in the abstract more logical to predict cruelty than it is to predict it of his parents. All that can be said about parental cruelty is that some individuals are so wicked as to be capable of it, and that can be said with even more plausibility of any other class or type or trade in the world. We may know a mother who has an unfortunate habit of boiling her baby, and in that case it will be well for the state to prevent her from doing so. But when we merely hand a baby from a mother we do not know, to an official we do not know, we are in logic transferring it to a less safe position from a safer one. These are all very primary and obvious principles, and are therefore nowadays entirely neglected. Divorce and the destruction of parental control, therefore, are the two main modern reforms, because they both express distrust of the two natural emotions that can in some reasonable degree be trusted. It is unjust, but it is not unnatural for a greengrocer to engage an assistant with the intention of sweating him, or a policeman to shadow a man with the intention of getting him into trouble. It is at least in a sense unnatural for a man to make love to a woman with the intention of beating her with a poker, or for a mother to bear a child with the intention of boiling him in a big pot. We should naturally infer, therefore, that human vigilance would be directed to watching and restraining the more probable rather than the less probable offense. As a matter of fact, modernity seems to ignore both the natural affection of fathers and mothers and the original sin of greengrocers and policemen. There is one thing, however, which the official classes certainly must not do. They must not complain of the chaos or criminality due to the loss of the authority of parents. That authority has been steadily undermined, not by the children, but by the officials. And though there is no reason to allege it of that particular magistrate, a good deal of it has been destroyed by the magistrates. End of section 35《ซัคชั่น36》of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, *The New Witness*, 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Hand. G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, *The New Witness*, 1921, by G. K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End, The Madhouse and the Nursery 
the much criticized criticism of nursery rhymes, which was recently uttered by Mrs. Barnett, was but part of a current cant generally uttered less courageously. Mrs. Barnett's surprise on discovering that a nonsense rhyme was nonsensical is only the logical application of a criticism now turned against all natural things, and therefore especially against all childish things. Our grandfathers made a child dress like a grown-up person, but they allowed him to think as a child and to feel as a child, and did not prematurely or impatiently require him to put away childish things. It is true that St. Paul says that when he becomes a man, he puts away childish things, And, with all reverence, I think it is perhaps one reason why popular Christian tradition has preferred St. Peter. But we do not wait until little Paul has become a man. People a hundred years ago dressed him like a mute at a funeral, but they allowed him to go on bowling a hoop to the verge of manhood. We dress him like a fairy in a pantomime, and then ask his opinion upon relativity and the League of Nations. For instance, there are new schools where children are taught to play at being politicians. They are no longer left to play at being pirates, that infinitely more honorable trade. They are assembled in little parliaments to vote on amendments and move the previous question and draw the speaker's attention to the fact that there are not 40 members present or whatever are the terms of the oligarchical tomfoolery which their elders endure. The child also will have nothing to add to what his right honorable friend told the House on April 1st, 1901. The infant also will discover that it is not to the public interest to state whether the Germans have landed in Kent. If this were all, indeed, the training of the rising generation in parliamentary politics would be merely elegant and external. But I presume that they are taught the realities as well as the ritual. A charming comedy is enacted when little Tommy toddles across to little Willie and offers him a coin or counter representing a financial share, in return for his support for a government contract. Even more exciting would be the scene in which Polly, aged six, boldly attempts to blackmail Peter, aged seven, and threatens to cover the nursery wall with posters, in colored chalks, revealing his naughtiness unless he hands over an adequate amount of toffee. Nor must we forget the occasion on which Tommy buys his toy coronet for 2,000 acid drops, or the responsibility of the two infants who act as party whips and have to carry all these sweets secretly in their pockets until they have dispensed them in various forms of corruption for the good of the cause. These are all operations requiring skill and training, and as it is obviously impossible to imagine modern parliamentary politics being conducted without them, it naturally follows that we shall carefully equip our young politicians with them. For the older and more experienced politicians perpetually tell us that the anomalies and abuses we criticize are inevitable and inseparable from all practical politics. As when Mr. Balfour said, of the Marconi case, that politicians must judge each other differently from the judgment of the cold world without. Or Mr. Bonar Law said it would be useless to audit the party funds, apparently because politicians are so passionately resolved on secrecy that they would start another secret fund to evade the audit. So that if these things are a part of parliamentary politics, and if those politics are to be taught to the little ones, we must certainly lose no time in teaching them the safest and most delicate methods of concealment and corruption. The truth is that all our educational experiments are in the wrong direction. They are concerned with turning children not only into men, but into modern men, whereas modern men need nothing so much as to be made a little more like children. The whole object of real education is a renaissance of wonder, a revival of that receptiveness to which poetry and religion appeal. Instead of turning the nursery or the infant school into an image of the political meeting or the stock exchange, there would be a far better case for turning the Senate or the market into imitation of the nursery. It would do the masters of bureaucracy or big business a great deal of good to be governed as children are governed and taught to amuse themselves easily as children do. Those aristocrats who suffer the charge of inhumanity when they hunt the fox would be wisely limited until they had learned to hunt the slipper. Those financial magnates who are never happy till they have made a corner would have to be content with puss in the corner. Their only ring would be poetically described as a ring of roses, and they would play at honey pots instead of money pots, as in the ordinary sense of making pots of money. 
I am not prepared to say how far such a Saturnalia of simplicity can be regarded as being within the sphere of practical politics. But I am quite serious when I say that this should be the direction of all education, and that nearly all modern education is a wild waste of money and time because it is working in the opposite direction. It is trying to sophisticate the people who are simple, or in other words, to pervert the only people who are right. When I was in America, for instance, some lunatics were actually trying to teach children to take care of their health. In other words, they were teaching babies to be valetudinarians and hypochondriacs in order that they might be healthy. They were even proud of their half-witted and wicked amusement, and one of them actually boasted that his school children were health mad. That it is not exactly the aim of all mental hygiene to be mad did not occur to him, but surely such teachers have everything to learn. I will not say from healthy children, but from all the naughty children who ever fell into the river and possibly got drowned before they could grow up into maniacs. If anyone thinks this is a merely violent form of words, I refer again to the example in which the words themselves were used by the people themselves. In America, some educational enthusiasts did really announce with pride that the children in a particular school were all health mad. This meant, it really and truly meant, that the infants were in an intense state of vigilance and concentrated excitement on the problem of the preservation of their own bodily health, on how to foresee indigestion or mark the stages of a cold. And the man meant, he really and truly meant, that this was a condition on which they were to be congratulated. So that, instead of toy helmets or toy swords, they would have toy goggles and toy respirators, Possibly, little toy bottles of a disinfectant, or even a toy hypodermic syringe. That anybody should be mad on anything is not exactly the goal and ideal of all mental science. That anybody should be mad on health is always, of all things, the most unhealthy. That children should be mad on health is something so horrible that one could hardly dream of it outside some such torture chamber as the tale called The Turn of the Screw, where children are possessed of devils. Yet I repeat that I read the boast with my own eyes in an American paper as a report of the success of a hygienic educational campaign. It was some silly stuff about sending a clown round to give serious advice on hygiene, enlivened with jokes. I bet the jokes were not so amusing as the serious remarks. I have noted more than once that the modern world is too ridiculous to be ridiculed. If we have grown so ignorant of the very shape and posture of man, that we do not know his head from his heels, it will not even amuse us that he should stand on his head. There would be faint amusement in an amoeba standing on his head because we are a little vague about which is his head. If we met some monster on the cyclic pattern of certain immaculae, but swollen to monstrous size and rolling down the road, we might show a shade of surprise, but we should hardly be overwhelmed with really hearty laughter. There would be nothing comic about his turning a cartwheel, he would be too like a cartwheel. It is amusing to see a little boy turn a cartwheel, in moderation, precisely because a little boy is not a wheel and is designed by his creator for a loftier end than that of drawing a cart. Now, the modern world cannot make head or tail of itself and therefore cannot see the fun of itself, even when it is engaged like a kitten in chasing its own tail. The little boy cannot become funny by being upside down because his earnest and thoughtful teachers are by no means certain about when he is right side up. At any moment, a professor of the new hygiene or the higher athletics may prove that a child standing on his feet is in a strained, unnatural posture, throwing too much weight on the ankle bone and undermining the whole nervous system. And then all the children will rest standing on their heads, and we should all be expected to take it seriously. And if the image be considered exaggerative, I recur to the example I have given before that in certain educational institutions in America, children are actually taught to cultivate a meticulous and medicinal care of their health, and that a eulogist of this extraordinary system actually used, as part of his eulogy, the statement that children were health mad. You cannot get anything madder than that. You cannot get anything regarded as mad where that is regarded as sane. You cannot get anything treated satirically where that is treated seriously. Satire is necessarily dead in a society so incapable of any natural reaction, in a society that has no kick in it, even when it has such things to kick. 
Imagine what a satirist of saner days would have made of the daily life of a child of six who is actually admitted to be mad on the subject of his own health. These are not days in which that great extravaganza could be written, but I dimly see some of its episodes like uncompleted dreams. I see the child pausing in the middle of a cartwheel, or when he has performed three quarters of a cartwheel, and consulting a little notebook about the amount of exercise per diem. I see him pausing halfway up a tree, or when he has climbed exactly one-third of a tree, and then producing a clinical thermometer to take his own temperature. But what would be the use of blazoning to the whole universe, in all imaginative colors, the manifestation of this idiot's madness, when he himself praises it for being mad? End of section 36. Section number 37 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by B.S.L. Reader. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921, by G.K. Chesterton. Section 37. At the Sign of the World's End, The Sea Monster and the Mob, by G. K. Chesterton. I happened to visit a well-known watering place somewhere about the end of this summer, or somewhere about the time when people were wondering whether it would ever end. It was a popular resort, so popular that many would describe it as vulgar. But at least it was popular as well as vulgar, and I know many more fashionable and luxurious resorts that have achieved the distinction of being vulgar, without being popular. It was the sort of place where one might still see the modern mummers who blacken their faces and call themselves niggers, as well as the yet more modern and less national sort that whiten their faces and call themselves pyros. But the blackening of the face is an old custom even in rural England, and when I first went to live in South Bucks, a man appeared on Christmas Eve announcing that he was St. George, and clinching the contention by wearing a top hat and a nightgown, flourishing an umbrella and presenting a smiling face covered with soot. I felt he was much more like St. George than the white comedian is like Pierrot, for at least his gestures and his generous eagerness to thump the Turkish knight with his umbrella were in the spirit of the comic combat with the dragon, whereas the other brought with him no whisper from that world of Watteau, with its sad and silvery frivolity, in which the French clown turns his moon-like face to the moon. Indeed, I once saw a local entertainment in which a whole mob of my most respectable neighbors all blacked their faces and became admirably wild and witty in the liberty of the disguise. I wondered whether the method might not be tried with advantage in the House of Commons or the Peace Conference or some other grave political group. We have but to call up before our imagination the portraits of our principal rulers and public men to realize how much their appearance would be improved by a thick coat of blacking. And my experience of the encouragement given by this sable masquerade is such as to lead me to hope that their utterance would show a similar improvement. If only all members of Parliament wore these black masks, their present timidity might vanish, and bursts of brilliancy, of eloquence, and of reason would startle the world. But I must not be led away, even by the promise of this great progressive reform, for it was not my intention to write about Negroes, natural or artificial, but about watering places, which at best perhaps are rather artificial than natural. In one sense, perhaps they have grown more artificial, in growing more natural, or at least in seeking a wilder aspect of nature. It was logical in the 18th century to speak of watering places for men, almost as we speak of watering places for horses. Men made pilgrimages to particular springs in order to drink the waters. It is rather curious that they now make pilgrimages to see the only water they cannot drink. Of course there are medicinal motives in the latter, as in the former case, but though people certainly go to bathe in the water, or to paddle in it, there is still a certain significance and something symbolic of the whole social trend of the time in the fact that many of them merely go to see it. The significance or mystery of that mob is that it is so largely a mob that has marched and gathered merely to stare at the sea. In this respect, it is like the mob that gathers merely to stare at a football match, or still more that which gathers to stare at a horse race. The horse is a beautiful and wonderful animal, 
and the sea is a beautiful and wonderful element. But there is something lacking in the modern interest taken in the white horses of the sea, as in the motley horses of the racing track. The distinction can be seen in those places, like the place I visited, where the new watering place is linked with an old fishing village. Our fathers used their seas as they used their horses, and perhaps did not often contemplate them except when they were using them. Swinburne, a spirited exponent of the latter and more Byronic view of nature, perpetually praised the sea. But he praised it as barren. He praised it in so many words as sterile and fruitless. In short, he perpetually praised it as useless and hopeless and vain. But for a fisherman setting forth from that little port in the Middle Ages, the sea was not vain or sterile. It would never be without fruit until it was without fish. But Swinburne certainly at least swam in the sea, and he did not even confine himself to paddling. There is a verse of his, however, which might fancifully be supposed to conceal, though probably unintentionally, something like a humorous criticism upon the paddlers, and still more on the starers. I think it is at the end of the dedication to William Morris of the second volume of, quote, Poems and Ballads, close quote, that there occurs something like the following verse, which I quote from memory. Till the sons of the sons of the Norsemen watch hurtling to windward and lee, round England, unbacked of her horsemen, the steed of the sea. Swinburne was proverbially prone to make some sacrifice of sense to sound, and I confess I am not very clear about what, quote, unbacked of her horsemen, close quote, means. But it might be held, by the more satirical, to mean that England now contains a good many horsemen who never ride on horses. And it might still more cogently be held to mean that the sons of the sons of the Norsemen had so far degenerated from their ancestors that they much preferred staring at the sea to sailing on it. And certainly there are many nowadays who accept the hygienic advantages of the sea without even the Swinburnian swimming, let alone the Scandinavian sailing. The point is not, however, that there is necessarily any degeneracy in this. In simpler days, the number of those who either sailed or swam or saw may perhaps have been no larger, or may possibly have been smaller, merely because the population was smaller. The point is in the popularity of the purely contemplative pleasure. The point is that there is something strange about the very idea of whole huge crowds of people looking at the sea, as there would be about whole huge crowds of people listening to the skylark. We talk about the bustle and movement of these urban multitudes, but surely there is something almost more singular about their immobility and their repose. Under all else, the modern mood is the passive mood. With all its superficial revolutions, it is the very reverse of revolutionary. So far from having an ambition of ruling itself, it has lost the old and universal habit of amusing itself. For modern men do not amuse themselves. They are amused, which is quite a different thing. There has been an enormous increase in the machinery of amusement, such as ballets and cinemas, but it is almost the definition of a machine that it has only a few handles worked out by a few hands. Everywhere there is a new apparatus of amusement made by the few for the many. There was just such a new apparatus in the old amphitheater. Doubtless the gladiators and wild beasts were advertised in much the same manner, and in some cases more appropriately. It would seem more apt to speak of releasing a lion than of releasing a film. And those old comic actors who acted in monstrous or bestial masks might more rationally be described as featuring their parts. But the essence of the panem et circenses method is that it is imposed from above upon a servile population that is, upon a population in the passive mood. Meanwhile, these same vast urban populations have largely lost what used to be the mark of all mankind, the spontaneous invention of ceremonials and festivities, dithering from village to village and sometimes from house to house. I speak of the modern tendency as meaning the tendency of the most recent centuries, and especially of the 19th century. That passive and servile tendency may be drawing to its end, I am sure I hope it is, and there are moments or moods when I think it is. There may possibly be, even in the present generation, a sudden general realization and therefore a revolution or reversal of tendency. There are certainly signs in various parts of our private life of a more spontaneous sort of social creation, and it is always possible that this may grow strong enough to overturn the theatricals of our public life, as the early Christians overturned the theatricals of the amphitheater. But it seemed to me, as I stared at those seaside crowds who stared at the sea, that upon them at least lay heavy, 
even in their pleasures, the passive mood of the servile state. It was not their vulgarity that alarmed me, but rather their quietude and good behavior. It was the mood of the pagan circus, because it was the mood of acceptance rather than creation. They looked at the sea as their prototypes looked at a lion in the Colosseum, or as their children look at a lion in the zoo. But the fisherman, the man of all the ages, the man of the morning of the world, is compared with that crowd like a man who suddenly leapt down into the arena and fought with the lion. The older dealing with the sea, at once fiercer and more fruitful, involved assaulting such a roaring and foaming monster, but also involved using him like a beast of burden. Doubtless there are still many who enjoy such dealing with the sea, as with a dragon of green and blue and every changing tint, but a dragon who guards a treasure. But at that moment there seemed to me something strange about that great multitude in a trance. I had a weird fancy for a flash that they were all in church, in a temple, worshiping a sacred snake. End of section 37. Reading by BSL Reader. Section 38 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Hand. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921, by G.K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End, Stephen Graham and His Servile State Mr. Stephen Graham has written, for a new magazine called The Beacon, a thing called A Credo for a New Era. He has often shown himself a fine, critical, and even creative artist, and I sincerely wish I could admire this composition as a creation, since I cannot admire it as a creed but in both characters it seems to me both hasty and hazy. It is based in separate sentences like separate paragraphs or lines of poetry, but it is hardly clear whether this is the extreme of snippety journalism or an experiment in vers libre. It is certainly a proclamation, but I know not whether its form is founded on Walt Whitman or the post office regulations. It is not a creed, for it does not maintain the method of dogmatic and orderly affirmation of things believed. It wanders away into metaphors and impressions and historical memories, and is certainly not the creed for a new era, for it was the view of nearly all the more aged intellectuals when I was ten years old. It is internationalism as it was before the war, and communism as it was before the Russian Revolution. We sigh as we read once more, as in some dog-eared old copy book of our school days, for patriotism is another word for a nation's selfishness. We read patriotism has had its day, and sigh again. It hardly seems necessary to say anything, but if I had to answer Mr. Graham, it would be in two words. They are words in a foreign language, and one I do not understand. Sin, fain. So far as an intellectual principle runs through the process, it is extraordinarily simple. It is that what matters is quantity and not quality. The larger and larger grow the groups we belong to, the better. It is good when a man thinks for two as if they were one, as when he marries. The example is excellent, but the test may appear somewhat alarming. For instance, if a man marries two wives, he thinks for three as if they were one. Or, should he prefer to marry ten wives, he will think for eleven as if they were one. Now, even if the New Era thinks the Muslim or Mormon view of women superior to the Christian, it is surely obvious that nothing can be settled by so simple an arithmetical process as this. It would give a moral superiority, not only to the man with ten wives, but still more to the man with ten thousand slaves. And indeed, Mr. Graham seems to imply though in a rather confused fashion, that feudalism and capitalism are thus relatively good merely because they are relatively large. If there was one good thing done by the Bolshevist revolt amid all its evil, it was that at least it left for dead this piece of 19th century nonsense about encouraging big shops because they could be turned into state departments, of promoting capitalism in order to turn it into socialism. 
The socialist revolt did not come in a capitalist country at all, and the best thing about the Marxian movement was that it falsified all the Marxian calculations. The three most important sentences in this creed, so far as I am concerned, run as follows. There should be no absolute property in house and land, no real estate. The houses we live in we should be bound to leave more beautiful and more fitting to be lived in. Not relying on landlords or lords of the manor, or on any lords but upon ourselves. Now, I cannot, for the life of me, see how we can be especially said to rely on ourselves if somebody else bind us to make the house we live in more beautiful, according to his taste and not ours. Obviously, there is nothing about which men differ so much as beauty, including beauty of house decoration. And I must either be free to make it what I think beautiful and others may think ugly, or others must be free to make it what they think beautiful and I think ugly. And the latter is obviously what Mr. Stephen Graham does mean, for he talks of my being bound to do it, not disposed to do it. Now, whoever these other people are, they are authorities and very arbitrary authorities, for in the realm of art, authority is especially arbitrary. They may not be called lords of the manor, but they will certainly be lords. Indeed, they will be something more than landlords. They will be, in a peculiar sense, house lords. They will be lords not only of my land, but of my life. In one point, indeed, Mr. Stephen Graham has been particularly careful to produce a positive parody of the very worst landlordism. In Ireland, and in every country that has suffered a tyranny of landlords, the worst feature was always the fact that the tenants could only improve the house for the benefit of his master. But at least nobody ever proposed that he should be forced to improve the house for the benefit of his master. That last ride of the rack-renting spirit is left for Mr. Stephen Graham and the credo of the new era. It is a pleasing picture, and worth pausing upon for its own sake. I like to think of the new tenant who is burdened with the duties of a new architect. I like to think of his face and reflections when he finds he has not only got to leave the house in reasonable order and repair, but to add to it such gargoyles, flying buttresses, pinnacles, or pagodas as may seem most likely to please posterity, or rather the prophets who think they know all about posterity. As a matter of fact, a most fantastic comedy could be written about such prophets and how their prophecies would fare. Of course, the old abbot would be turned out of the old abbey because he had made it ugly with barbarous Gothic which the Renaissance noblemen would replace with a more or less Greek temple with graceful Corinthian columns. But the extraordinary thing is that by the time of Pugin and Ruskin, not only would the Corinthian style be regarded as ugly, but the old original Gothic style would be regarded as beautiful. Even in the past, the process of leaving to others what they would think more beautiful would be a risky business. In the conditions of the present, the changes would be a series of dizzy disappointments. The brain reels in considering the dilemma of a householder not only required to add a few vorticist touches to a cubist building, but necessarily bound to wonder what was coming after post-post-impressionism, and whether any form of futurism has a chance of surviving into the future. The truth is that from this single case of domestic decoration which Mr. Graham has selected, Mr. Graham's communism could be refuted. Art is, in its nature, an act of authority and therefore of possession, and all possession which passes into production has something of the authority of art. To talk of a peasant as a mere grabber of so much mud is exactly like talking of a sculptor as a mere grabber of so much clay. You may say, if you like, that the artist is selfish in modeling a statuette so as to satisfy himself, but that is the way that statuettes are made, when they are worth making, and that is the way that life is lived when it is worth living. Here are two other lines from the new creed. There shall be economic peace. The only war will be against obstructive privilege and private interest. It is somewhat typical of the form, or rather formlessness, of the whole thing. It rather reminds me of a passage in some satire which ran rather like this. There was a profound silence broken only by the hooting of the siren, the booming of the guns, the loud braying of the brass band, and so on. Why say there is going to be a peace if there is going to be a war so huge as one waged against all the private interests of men? I, for one, can assure Mr. Graham that if the private interest he denounces is my own interest in the decoration of my own private house, I can promise he shall have as little economic or other peace as I can give him. 
If the obstructive privilege is my own present privilege of hanging up English watercolors instead of diagrams out of blast, I will promise him that it shall be an extremely obstructive privilege. I shall certainly join in the obstructionist party, and it will be a larger party than he seems to suppose, even in the new era. But what would his piece be, even if he could get it? About this also he is commendably candid. There shall be a standard rate of wage for labor in all lands. The conditions of employment shall be one and the same in all lands. These two things taken together at least make two other things equally clear. First, that he contemplates the continuance of the wage system through his utopia. And second, that he actually proposes to extend the wage system and force it upon those who are at present free from it. Every independent peasant is to be robbed of his independence and made dependent on a wage. Every independent guild is to be broken up, for conditions of employment must be one and the same in all lands. Every peddler or hawker of the wages he has made in every village fair in the world is to be captured and conscripted as a new sort of wage slave. This is what the creed means, on the assumption that it means anything. That anybody should propose so sweeping an enslavement would be extraordinary. That it should be proposed by the man who wrote the beautiful studies of the Russian peasantry is almost incredible. End of section 38. Section 39 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921, by G. K. Chesterton, Section 39, At the Sign of the World's End, Murder in the Might Have Been, by G. K. Chesterton. There had grown upon me of late, or at least until very lately, a mystical and almost fatalistic feeling that I should end in a state of great sympathy with the Dean of St. Paul's, even if the sympathy were by no means reciprocated. It was a strange and solemn sensation, but there was certainly something of virility and even of virtue in his very cynicism, especially after a debauch of the dull optimism and progressive sentimentality of so much of the press. Certainly the most defensible thing about the gloomy dean is his gloom. I cannot but think it somewhat more defensible than his deanery. Considered as a Christian, he is an anomaly, but considered as a heathen, he is a sincere and suggestive thinker. Indeed, he is sometimes so thoroughly heathen as to be positively human, and so almost to be Christian without knowing it. For instance, when he said that all forms of government are so bad they will never last long enough to do much harm, or words to that effect, my soul sang aloud over that happy and cheering piece of pessimism that at least is perfectly Christian, though hardly typical of his own school of Christianity. It is a far more sensible test of the doctrine of the fall of man than following the endless doubts and doubtings of the higher criticism of Genesis. And then, just as I am drifting into a positive enthusiasm for the Dean, I am rescued and restored to sanity by his remarks about unwanted children. I do not criticize primarily his dallying with the doctrine of birth control, warmly as I condemn it. I criticize something in his tone, even about more tenable things. Thus, when he says that the unwanted child takes the place of a potential and superior, he says it in an indescribable and individual way that rouses in me a highly individual impatience. To begin with, the whole of this question of persons occupying space that might be occupied by other persons is itself highly personal. I am conscious that wherever I stand, I fill up the standing ground of another man, 
or, as the more satirical have been known to suggest, of several other men. I certainly do, in an appreciable degree, cover the ground, and it is always very arguable that I cumber the earth. But Dean Inga also is himself an occupant of space potentially useful for other purposes, and he fills a much larger place, if not physically, at least socially. I trust it will be taken as a compliment, and not merely as a flippancy. If I say he can fill St. Paul's Cathedral, no characterist ever compared my dimensions to those of St. Paul's Cathedral, though some have assimilated my outline to the same architectural style. Moreover, the dean is comparing the occupant of any place, not merely to every one who exists, but to anyone who might have existed. Our arrivals are the great might have been, or the babe unborn. And if we are to allow our imagination such flights into the prenatal twilight, or the primeval dawn, we might surely even allow ourselves the audacity of fancying somebody more fitted than Dr. Inge to fill St. Paul's Cathedral. Thus we might imagine a man occupying such a pulpit and such a church who might actually prefer to say a word or two in favor of the peculiar ethics of Christianity. It is at least conceivable, in the abstract, that a man in that position might prefer that course to specializing entirely in its alleged doubts and difficulties. The dean may be entitled, and doubtless he sincerely thinks himself entitled, to use the supreme pulpit of the supreme city of the British Empire to impose his individual shade of modernism or monaism, or whatever it is that makes him doubt the resurrection of the body or the miracles of the New Testament. Still, our imagination can take in the possibility of a preacher in the Apostles' Cathedral who should happen to be satisfied with the Apostles' Creed. We can call up the fancy picture of a priest of St. Paul's who should agree with St. Paul. It hardly involves a contradiction in terms, or even a physical impossibility. It only involves the same logical flight of fancy which Dr. Inge himself indulges about alternative or hypothetical children. We also are free to fancy a dean unborn, or an Inge that might have been. We are at liberty to picture him, not even as a gloomy dean, but as a gloriously jovial and dancing dean. Somewhere in these golden skies beyond the skies we know, hovers like a bird, the gaily feathered cherub, or bright-winged babe, who might have been dean of St. Paul's somewhere in the mysterious antechambers of creation. He is kicking his heels with impatience, perhaps, but with undiminished hilarity, whose twirls and capers might have enlivened the world on the top of Ludgate Hill. Such speculations may seem to fall short of the practical, but they seem to me quite as morally helpful as those about the unwanted child. And I suggest that a little modesty, not to mention humor, which suggests to most of us that there is always a potential query about who is wanted. Now, as a general truth, a man is no more to be trusted with a theory to decide what prospective type of child ought to be brought into the world than he is to be trusted with a loaded revolver to decide what sort of man ought to go out of the world. In this sense, at least, such a scientific hypothesis has something of the mystical character of murder. How varied and how extraordinary are men's opinions about other men's claim to existence could be illustrated by a hundred modern instances, and by one at least, in which Dr. Inge himself has been made to figure. I saw him quoted the other day as having said that he would like to see the leaders of a strike hanged. Naturally, I hope that the report might have been a slander, for, whatever our controversial differences, I cannot wish him so ill as to hope that he really said that. But supposing for the sake of argument that he said something like it, it is an interesting example of the sort of thing I mean, of the amazing moral abysses between different modern minds on this matter. A man who goes on strike is simply a man who happens to agree with a number of other men that a certain proposed monetary bargain is not worth accepting. 
one free citizen offers another free citizen a shilling to induce him to do a certain thing and the second free citizen comes to the conclusion that he cannot afford to do it except for eighteen pence these contracts are considered and debated over the commercial world and all sorts of advice or personal influence are called in in the course of the conversations that culminate in acceptance or rejection according to the moral judgment quoted any adviser ought to risk the gallows if his advice is likely to lead up to rejection rather than acceptance if a solicitor suggests to his client that he's being asked too much in the sale or purchase of an estate the solicitor deserves death if a doctor strongly advises his patient not to take the lease of a rather damp house by the river the doctor ought to be killed if a cricketer advises his friends not to club together to buy a particular meadow for a cricket field justice cries to heaven for his blood but this is exactly what is done by anybody who advises a workman not to work for a wage because it is inadequate or unjust i am well aware that neither the dean of st paul's nor any one else however much in agreement with him would be likely to erect a row of gibbets for the solicitor the doctor and the cricketer but that is only because the thinkers of that school of thought will do anything except think they have never even stopped for a moment to consider what a strike is beyond the fact that it is a nuisance they are generally as a matter of fact the mere dupes of the verbal accident by which the word strike happens to sound vaguely like an act of violence in other words they are in a position of people who should suppose that beating a man down is a bargain actually meant bashing him down to the ground with a bludgeon they are like men who should suppose that putting your shirt on a horse really meant attiring the noble quadruped in your own nightshirt the sort of journalese verbalism that makes the confusion in the case of strikes may seem less startling to the imagination than these images but the talk about hanging strikers and it has been talked by some people at least is enough to show that it is quite as startling in its effects as the moral sense it is clear that it leads straight to murder if it be only judicial murder i may say something on a future occasion about the particular case of the dean and his sociology but i am only remarking here on the general morality of these speculations but who ought or ought not to exist if men can believe that the miscarriage of an economic bargain is a case for killing what are we to think of their judgment of the conditions economic or other which constitute a case for giving life if they have such wild and crazy notions about the people who have a right to live why should we trust their notions about the people who have a right to breed if they would cut short a life for nothing will they not prevent a life for less i have already admitted that they are unconscious of the horrible issue of their own ideas they have a claim to something more than divine indulgence extended to those of old time who are equally eager and ready to erect a gibbet they not only know not what they do but they know not what they say but truly it does not entirely restore intellectual confidence in them to explain that they cannot comprehend the meaning of their own remarks and the ancient parallel to which i have alluded is not perhaps the least appropriate because that glorious gibbet was avowedly set up to slay an inciter of the people and a disturber of the peace end of section thirty nine recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 40 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns The New Witness, 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Akabuchan. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 
1921, by G.K. Chesterton. Section 40. At the Sign of the World's End. Concerning a Strange City. Everyone has his own private and almost secret selection among the examples of the mysterious power of words. The power which a certain verbal combination has over the emotions and even over the soul. It is a commonplace that literature sometimes has a charm, not merely in the sense of the charm of a woman, but of the charm of a witch. Historical scholars question how the ignorant imagination of the Dark Ages distorted the poet Virgil into a magician. And one answer to the question, possibly, is that he was one. Theologians and philosophers debate about the inspiration of scripture, but perhaps the most philosophical argument for certain scriptural sayings being inspired is simply that they sound like it. The great lines of the poets are like landscapes or visions, but the same strange light can be found not only in the high places of poetry, but in quite obscure corners of prose. And in my own personal case, there are no words in literature that more directly produce this indescribable effect than a few that appear almost accidentally in one episode of Mallory's Romance of Arthur. They occur in one of the visions of Sir Galahad, or it may be Sir Percival, for the rest of the scene has rather faded from my memory, save for the constellation of words that shines in the midst of it. But I think that St. Joseph of Arimathea shows the knight a vision of a veiled object, presumably the Holy Grail and he adds the sentence, But you shall see it unveiled in the city of Saras, in the spiritual place. The soul of this, of course, escapes analysis, but for all that, an attempt at analysis has certain aspects of interest. I can only express what I mean by saying that it is the finite part of the image that really suggests infinity. Most worthy and serious people instead of saying the spiritual place, would say the spiritual world. Some dismal and disgusting people, instead of saying the spiritual place, would say the spiritual plane. And the immediate chill and disenchantment of these changes is due to a vague but vivid sense that the spiritual thing has become less real. A world sounds like an astronomical diagram, and a plane sounds like a geometrical diagram, and both these are abstractions. But a place is not an abstraction, but an actuality. And the writer not only says definitely that it is a place, but he gives it a definite name like the name of a place. Saras is not an abstraction. It is not even an allegory. It is not even as if he had said the city of heaven, or the city of paradise. These, though not unreal, are at least universal. But the name given has identity, which is something much more intense than universality. Saras only means Saras, as Sarum only means Sarum, or, for that matter, as Surbiton only means Surbiton. But the very fact that we have never heard of it before, and that it is never mentioned again, that it is referred to in passing and without explanation, gives a curious intensity to the hint of something at once distant and definite. The spiritual thrill is all in the idea that the place is a place, however spiritual that it is some strange spot where the sky touches the earth or where eternity contrives to live on the borderland of time and space. I wish there were a real philosophy of comparative religion and one that was not full of inhuman nonsense. I wish it did not tend, for instance, to one particular trick of unreason. The most recent example I know is a phrase in the interesting outline of history, 
of Mr. Wells, that in which he says that the Christian sacrament of bread and wine was a break back to primitive blood sacrifices. Or sometimes a man will say that the feeling about the Madonna is only the revival of the worship of Isis, or that the idea of Saint Michael smiting Satan is the same as that about Mithras, who slew a bull. Now, there are many other more historical objections to this sort of thing, but my primary objection to it is that it not only puts the cart before the horse, but gives me directions for finding my own horse in my own stable by looking for a primitive Mycenaean chariot of which no traces remain. Instead of explaining X by saying it is equal to 5, it undertakes to explain 5 by saying it is equal to X. It is as if a man said, You may not be aware that your feelings about your wife are best described as those of the missing link at the sight of an oyster shell. Or it is, as if, he said, should you desire to know what are your opinions about the coalition government, they are identical with those of the man who built the Great Pyramid on the choice between a bronze and iron currency. I know what a Christian feels about the idea that Michael smote a rebel angel. I do not in the least know what the Mithraist feels about the idea that Mithras killed a bull. It may really have been something like the Christian feeling, for all I know. It may also have been the worst sort of heathen feeling, for all I know. But to have the thing that I do know explained to me by the thing that I don't know is like nonsense out of Alice in Wonderland. It is offering something inexplicable to explain something that needs no explanation. I cannot tell whether anybody really felt anything about Isis comparable to what men feel about Mary. If anybody did, I am sure I congratulate him. But I declined to have my own feelings revealed to myself, in the light of some remote alleged feelings that no man alive has ever felt. But though there is this abyss of agnosticism between dead faiths and living ones, and between religions that are experienced and religions that are only explored, it might be possible to establish some human connection if the people who did it were more human, if they took the simple things that really are similar instead of merely trying to assimilate the civilized things to the barbaric things. They might really bridge some of those abysses in the name of the brotherhood of men if they were not so anxious to say that the sacrament and the sacrifices were both cannibal orgies, which is nonsense, they might say that they were both sacrifices and had something to do with a philosophy of sacrifice, which is sense. And then, instead of having less respect for the Christians, we might have more respect for the cannibals. If they were not so anxious to compare the virgin to a heathen goddess, they might possibly compare them both to a human mother and at least get near to something human, if not to something divine. And in the same way, if they were not so eager to compare a shrine or a sacred soil to fetishism and taboo, they might get some sort of glimpse of what all men mean by making a deity local or talking of a spiritual place. At least in the mind of man, if not in the nature of things, there seems to be some connection between concentration and reality. When we want to ask in natural language whether a thing really exists or not, we ask if it is really there or not. We say there even if we do not clearly understand where. A man cannot enter a house by five doors at once. He might do it if he were an atmosphere, but he does not want to be an atmosphere. He has a stubborn, subconscious belief that an animal is greater than an atmosphere. In proportion, as a thing rises in the scale of things, it tends to localize and even narrow its natural functions. A man cannot absorb his sustenance through all his pores like a sponge or some low sea organism. He cannot take in an atmosphere of beef 
or an abstract essence of buns. Any buns thrown at him, as at the bear at the zoo, must be projected with such skill as to hit a particular hole in his head. In nature, in a sense, there is choice even before there is will. The plant or bulb narrows itself and pierces at one place rather than another, and all growth is a pattern of such green wedges. But however it be with these lower things, there has always been this spear-like selection and concentration in man's conception of higher things. And compared with that, there is something not only vague, but vulgar in most of the talk about infinity. The pantheist is right up to a certain point, but so is the sponge. Both vitally and verbally, this infinity is the enemy of all that is fine. Such philological points are sometimes more than mere pedantries or mere puns. And it is more than a pedantic pun to say that most things that are fine are finite. We testify to it when we talk of a beautiful thing having refinement or having finish. It is brought to an end like the blade of a beautiful sword, not only to its end in the sense of its cessation, but to its end in the sense of its aim. All fine things are in this sense finished, even when they are eternal. Poetry is committed to this concentration fully as much as religion, for fairyland has always been as local, one might say as parochial, as heaven. And if religion in the recognized sense were removed tomorrow, the poets would only begin to act as the pagans acted. They would begin to say, Lo, here, and lo, there. From the incurable itch of the idea that the something must be somewhere and not merely anywhere. Even if it were in some sense found to be in everything, it would still be in everything and not merely in all. And if men did indeed seek the secret in primitive sacrifices, it was a secret and not a superficiality, like fetish worship. If they did indeed look for it behind the veil of Isis, it was a secret and not a platitude like nature worship. And if indeed it is better sought in another fashion, it will be a secret and therefore a real revelation. For those who see it unveiled in the city of Saras, in the spiritual place. End of section 40. Concerning a strange city. Recording by John Akabachan. Section 41 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921, by G. K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End, The Orangeman and the Englishman. The English quite sincerely hate cruelty. That is why they hate to hear of their own cruelty. That is why it goes on. They never desire a direct democratic revenge, with a mob committing a massacre. The details of such visible vengeance, in all sincerity, sicken them. There is always somebody or something deputed to do the dirty work, if it be only an aristocracy. The nation has tended to an oligarchical polity, very largely because such government is generally a secret, and is kept a secret from the nation in whose name it is done. Whenever the nation itself happens to learn what is done, it generally has a revulsion of better feeling, as it has recently had after the revelations about reprisals. Its fault is that at the best it is too often content not to know, and at the worst that it tries to avoid knowing. But though this dislike of conscious ferocity has done good service of late, 
it is itself responsible for some lingering misunderstandings. One of them is this, that there is quite as much misunderstanding between Westminster and Belfast as between Westminster and Dublin. The Englishman does not understand the Orangeman any more than he understands the Sinn Feiner. The Orangeman does not understand the Englishman, probably not half so well as he understands the Sinn Feiner. The Englishman and the Orangeman have talked the same sort of nonsense for nearly a hundred years, but they have never talked the same sort of sense. If ever the two kinds of Irishmen talk the same sort of sense, the problem will be solved. But even then, an Englishman like myself will not understand the solution. The Orangemen are anti-national, but they are not unnational. They may hate Ireland, but they are Irish. They are certainly the very reverse of English. Indeed, it is the paradox of patriotism and the profoundest argument for it that a man is never so national as when he struggles not to be. The internationalist avoids being nationalist, but not being national. We could not imagine anybody more purely English than Codbin, or anybody more purely Russian than Tolstoy. It is hard to imagine an English Tolstoy, and impossible to imagine a Russian Cobden. Nowhere else except in England could you find the particular type that was called the Conchi. Nowhere else except in England could you find the comic spirit that was content with calling him a Conchi. In any other country similarly placed, and most of all in Ireland, he would simply have been called a traitor. There is something extraordinarily characteristic of England in terms like Bolshe and Conchi, which almost turn terms of abuse into terms of endearment. It is mixed of the imagination of some monster in a nursery rhyme with the disposition to pat and humor some sort of furry foreign animal. But this is a digression on the English character. Now all Irishmen have too much tenderness to hate. It is middle course between the two extremes, of too much murder on one side and too little on the other. But the vital difference between Orangemen and ordinary Irishmen is this, that the more normal and national type still have things that they positively love as well as things that they positively hate. The sincerity of Belfast has become simply negative. It is hate and nothing else. People are perpetually talking of Ireland as the scene of a conflict between two religions, but they seldom seem to see the contrast between the religions. It is not a question of religious preference or prejudice. It is a question of objective experience. We know that there are now many people with a passionate affection for Catholicism, and that there are not many people with a passionate affection for Calvinism. There were once, but there are not now. We know it as a fact that we know that a great many people still call themselves liberals, and that not very many people still call themselves Lancastrians. We know it as we know that there is still a nation of the Jews, and no longer a nation of the Jebusites. It has nothing to do with sympathies. It does not exclude regrets. You or I may still be devoted to the cause of the House of Lancaster, may wear red roses in our buttonholes, and weed out white roses from our garden, may take Henry the Sixth for a patron saint, and keep the date of Tewkesbury as a fast. But we know that our Lancastrian League is not so large as the National Liberal Club. In the comparison between the two Palestinian races, if we prefer the Jebusites, it is not because we are particularly well acquainted with Jebusites. The anti-Semite would say we prefer Jebusites because we are particularly well acquainted with Jews. I have never been an anti-Semite, after that Jebusite fashion, but the point is that nobody disputes which of the two tribes has most clearly survived. Nobody now disputes which of the two theological theories has most clearly survived. We may say that we do not care about the theological theory of the Covenanters, but the Covenanters did. Even then, however, the Northern theory tended to be a little more negative than the Southern. When an honest fellow said, To hell with the Pope, in the old days, it is possible that he did really call up a vision of what he conceived to be loathsome and blasphemous pontiffs, 
delivered to the worm and the flame it is not so certain that he has or even that he had a vivid vision of king william the third sitting under a golden orange tree in paradise now any peasant at any period may have made for himself a similar picture of saint patrick in paradise the mind of the south is and always has been full of positive images objects of praise and pictures of happiness it may hate what it hates too fiercely but it is not always thinking about the things that it hates its thoughts apart from theological partisanship often go to heaven with the holy patrick i know it is considered very bad taste by political and journalistic conventions to talk about the substance of any belief as distinct from the label of it a journalist may wave the flag of a religion as an incitement to riot and persecution or a signal for lynching and looting or a symbol of completed conquest and enslavement he may use the name of the religion as a bogey with which to frighten provincials or an asset with which to bargain with politicians or a catchword to create an atmosphere at public meetings or a tag to be used for the making of maps or statistics but that anybody should inquire not about the flag or badge or name of the religion but about the religion itself is considered grossly indelicate the real difficulty is not in the strength of their calvinism but rather in the decay of their calvinism the weakening of the positive dogma of this group of irishmen has driven them back far too much on the fierce negations of the irish temperament has isolated their power of hatred without balancing it with their power of love they have really lost the faith of their fathers or that part of the faith that their fathers really cared about but they do not relapse as the english would do into a sort of pagan optimism and a somewhat servile contentment with the things of the world having lost the faith they take refuge in the feud the feud is a thing very alien to the english temperament and a thing that has in fact wholly faded out of english history but the feud is not a thing to be dismissed as most modern englishmen would dismiss it as something dead and meaningless it is a thing that the highest christianity must necessarily condemn but it does not follow that the more servile paganism always has the right to condemn it the feud is a drama that draws its life from hate as a love affair draws it from love but there are worse fates than to be a figure even in such a drama such a man gains from it that fixed loyalty combined with fluctuating circumstance which constitutes romance he looks back to the battles won and lost in a sort of balance or rhythm he has pride and purpose in memory when the orangeman says he wishes to preach the pure and enlightened protestant religion to the superstitious savages of dublin he is talking antiquated cant but when he says that the papists learnt that the walls of londonderry could be defended as well as the walls of limerick he is not talking cant he is talking the patriotic eloquence of the feud it is not the problem of giving up the faith but the problem of giving up the fight that is the one genuine difficulty from the old guard of the orange tradition but the english cannot comprehend people having come to love a fight for its own sake or merely because it is a story he asks what people are fighting about and does not realize that they are fighting about the story of the fight that self-renewing romance or nightmare as we happen to regard it is the soul and immortality of the feud to the english the feud would be a nightmare but to some at least of the irish the feud has been almost a fairy tale how serious it is how self-deceptive it is how far it can be cured or need be cured are things that an englishman is cut off from understanding and for that reason if there were no other i am one of that daily increasing crowd of englishmen who wish to leave irishmen to look after themselves End of section forty one Section 42 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921, by G. K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End, The Ugliness of Utopia. It is a pity that the people who are trying to attack the worst sort of Bolshevism have got hold of the very worst way of doing it. I have been called a reactionary, and in one sense I am a reactionary. But I am quite sure there is one golden rule for all good little reactionaries to learn. It is no good to give a superficial answer to a fundamental suggestion, even if it is fundamentally false. Indeed, if it is fundamentally false, it is all the more necessary to answer it with what is fundamentally true. There is no answer to anything radical, even radically wrong, except being more radical still. If the other man has dug deep enough to have almost torn the plant up by its roots, we must dig deeper and see that it brings its own soil with it, so that it can live. If the enemy is mining, we must be countermining, and the countermining must be undermining. If the wrong sort of revolutionist is indeed undermining society, he will most certainly blow up society unless we can undermine him. The revolutionist will win unless we can be more revolutionary than he, in the fundamental sense of being at once more skeptical and more visionary. Now our real hold on the skeptic is almost always in this, that there is something which he does not doubt, and we do. Challenged upon his own first principles, he finds the whole of his movement checked. Thus, for instance, as long as we tell the Bolshevist that his ideal is a beautiful and bewitching illusion, he will lead men to worse fates in the future, if they follow it now. He will not altogether unnaturally say that it seems odd to refuse to follow an ideal because it is beautiful, and that even by our own account there is as yet nothing to show that it is deceptive. But if we tell him at the beginning that we think his ideal is ugly, that it is ugly as an ideal and not merely as a reality, and that as it is ugly in itself, we are naturally not going to be bothered to follow it. If we tell him that, he is brought to a much more serious standstill. In order to convert us, at any rate, he has to show that his ideal is not ugly, but beautiful and worth following. Now the modern materialist will find it much more difficult to charm like a poet than to plan plausibly like a company promoter. He will be less insinuating when he woos like a lover than when he takes chances like a tipster. It is not really so difficult for him to convince people that his idea is attainable, that he has figured it all out, like a man with a financial tip or a system for Monte Carlo. But we, by hypothesis, are not telling him that his idea is unattainable. We are telling him we do not want to attain it, whether it is attainable or not. What he has to create in us is a motive, that is, a thing that makes other things move. And it is not an easy business to create a motive. Not half so easy is to assume a motive and explain a plan. What he has to do, if he can, is what the great prophets and religious founders did. He has to make a sort of music in the air, to which things stir and march, even when they have seemed stiff as hedges or rooted as trees. And the modern economic materialist is no Orpheus. In short, it is easier to refute Bolshevism as an ideal than Bolshevism as a business proposition, and this for a very vital and interesting reason. That business can be mystified, whereas idealism must be plain. Anyone can see this by imagining any working example. Suppose a man knocks at the door with a proposition for providing everybody with a pair of stilts so that they can henceforth all walk about undefiled by mud and breathing a purer air on a level with the tops of trees. It would take a long time to prove to him that he cannot provide everybody with stilts. You might spend many happy hours with him in your library, looking up encyclopedias uncovering papers with calculations before you had proved to him from the census or the reports of the timber trade or the blue books on afforestation that the thing was impossible perhaps it isn't impossible an idea to be kept in mind about the other ideal also if you want to get rid of the gentleman selling stilts at the door 
it is much quicker to tell him that you don't want any stilts that you don't like stilts and that he has aroused no stilt motive like music in your mind or in short that walking on stilts forms no part of your ideal in short the idealistic answer is short sharp and practical whereas the practical answer is long-winded elaborate and tiresome if a man proposes to take you to johannesburg on one of those new amphibio automatic oil bicycles which are for all i know among the brightest and briskest business propositions advertised in that brilliant seat of culture it will take a long time to disprove to the tout that the bicycle can travel over land and sea it will need very complicated scientific calculation to demonstrate that the design is a swindle though since it emanates from the high places of imperial and scientific finance it very probably is it is much simpler to tell him the truth that burns immortally in the breast of every plain true-hearted englishman it is better to tell him that you do not want to go to johannesburg any more than to hell that is what i have to say to the bolshevist about the bolshevist utopia but the point here is that it would take a long time to go into the merits and demerits of the bicycle whereas it takes a very short time indeed to dismiss the merits and demerits of the south african city to get to the ideal is to get to the goal and be done with it to linger on the practical process may be interminable the idealistic method is businesslike the businesslike method is the devil of a business in the same way the really swift and simple modes of attack on marxian materialism and collectivism is simply pointing out that it is ugly not proving that it is unpractical it is in preventing people from desiring what the innovators think desirable much more than in merely prophesying whether they can get what they desire for a prophecy however practical is always arbitrary and mystical whereas a desire is a definite and objective fact like a dog or door knocker all men know what they want but only inspired seers know whether they can get it if men want property and liberty and the life of the distributive state as we maintain we will attempt to follow it up by proving it to be practical and probable but if men do not want collectivism and regimentation and compulsory labor and the rest of the bolshevist utopia then it will be a waste of our time to prove it impossible none of us will sit down to discuss the baffling difficulties of starting a pestilence or the little hitches and worries in the way of procuring a mad dog there is a truth probably unconscious in the common phrase that utopian revolutionists hope to make a new heaven and a new earth it is true that nobody makes a new earth without first making a new heaven and this is no more specially true when the heaven is full of gods and angels than when the heaven is empty of everything but ether and stardust it is quite as true when the heaven is only an abyss or bottomless pit of space it is quite as true when the heaven is rather like hell the higher thing towering over the earth and typifying the general nature of the universe is still the dominant condition and determining factor in all the earthly regulations and reforms the heaven of the atheist makes the earth of the atheist as much as the heaven of the saint makes the earth of the saint the basis of the whole marxian business is the religion of monism and materialism every man gets his economics from his religion only this religion is so laboriously topsy-turvy as to teach the opposite the notion that the religion came from the economics the answer to this is really quite simple the marxian socialist says that mental states come only from material conditions to which i reply that his material conditions are bad by his own account and therefore his mental conclusions are wrong by his own argument if the situation makes the soul and if it is a bad situation to be a proletarian then it is probably a worse situation to be a class-conscious proletarian if capitalism is a mood of material origin socialism is a mood of the very same material origin and that admittedly a very bad and misleading origin if economics produces ethics we have no more reason to trust the psychology of a proletarian brought up in a capitalist state than that of a capitalist brought up in a capitalist state 
the truth is that this is one intrinsically impossible and intolerable school of thought because it is thought against thinking the man who says that ideas are mere material results has in that very sentence destroyed all ideas including that one but there is an even deeper element among these elements of the case it is perhaps the element of emotion rather than thought why should a man want to maintain that his will is a blind plant of the swamp or that his ideals are idols made of mud why should men desire to entertain such a dogma as the materialist version of history i do not speak here of puzzle-headed skeptics who reluctantly digest such dogmas because they cannot reason their way out of them but of men who shout them like a war cry and intone them like a creed we can only say that there seems to be some such pessimistic perversity and spiritual suicide and that this sect must be counted among the strange sects so afflicted in practical fact i think they are often fighting against very real plutocratic tyranny but in truth there are two very different fights against tyranny there is the revolt against the tyrant by the slave and there is the revolt against the tyrant by the free man what nietzsche said of christianity what was emphatically not true of christianity actually is true of marxian materialism it is a slave morality a protest against particular authorities made by the spirit of slavery and not by the spirit of liberty for if it were really working from the love of freedom it would certainly begin with free will end of section forty two section forty three of g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen twenty one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen twenty one by g k chesterton man versus mankind it is said that the bolshevist leaders have tried to brighten things up by affixing to various public buildings the cheery announcement religion is the opium of the people to this there are several obvious answers and some so obvious as to be superficial one is that it might be merciful to let people have opium when you confess you cannot let them have bread another is that religion does not so much resemble opium as some irreligion resembles hashish from which comes the word assassin but these are perhaps too much in the nature of the retorts of the debating club it would be more profound comment when lenin calls religion the opium of the people to thank him for at least perceiving and confessing that it is essentially a possession of the people here at least religion is recognized as a popular thing as it is a popular thing rather more popular than opium if he had compared it to the ale of the people or even the wine of the people he would have been perfectly right and indeed he has his school show that they realize it by having their faces set in the direction of a fanatical negation of such things and a persecution of popular festivity one of the strangest but one of the strongest elements involved is the puritanism of bolshevism for the open secret called religion might well be symbolized by the french phrase about the french beverage in a paradox of almost purple magnificence it is called vin ordinaire but this is only true when the thing is a native drink and not an alien drug the red or golden glory of vin ordinaire is that it is always vin du pays opium is a sort of eastern spell fit only for fatalistic turks and chinamen and if it is to be the symbol of any philosophy i would suggest that it might symbolize that negative and necessitarian philosophy which has been most successfully preached by a race from palestine to an empire on the marches of asia precious little good has ever been done by abusing political opponents as atheists especially when they do not regard it as a term of abuse and indeed in the present case i do not regard it as the most abusive term they deserve what is the matter with these people is not merely that they are atheists 
but that they are something in that sense much worse. They are fatalists. Materialism, like that of Marx, must be sharply distinguished from the sort of Promethean free thought, vague and visionary perhaps, but poetical and therefore creative, which can be found in Shelley or in Songs Before Sunrise. That sort of free thought at least wishes to be free. In other words, that sort of free thought is at least free emotion. But Marxian materialism, by its own moral theory, works for enlightenment rather than emancipation. Its enlightenment is not meant to make men free, but to make them realize the impossibility of freedom. They are to be made to realize that they are parts of a machine, if it be only the cosmic machine, whose screws are stars and whose wheels are systems. In this there is nothing of the Promethean liberty or even anarchy nothing even of what poor Nietzsche met when he rejoiced that the unreasoning heavens were empty above him, nothing of what Bernard Shaw means when he preaches the increasing immortalities of creative evolution. This is not a tale of adventure like that of the Titan who stole fire from heaven and scattered it about him on earth. Rather, it is the tale of a more laborious Titan who carried up mud from earth and carefully dumped it down in heaven. This mechanical fatalism, so far from bringing the fire of freedom into the winter of captivity, brings a new idea of captivity into the parts of life that have been accounted free. It has none of the plausible and pagan grandeur of the revolt of Prometheus, or even the revolt of Adam. Shelley and Swinburne, like the serpent, tempted men to ignore God in order that they themselves might become as gods. They were to know good and evil, and presumably choose even if they chose evil. But Marx and the materialists tempt men by telling them that they shall be the very reverse of gods, that they shall be something less than men. The Bolshevists will regard even the red and white armies as something like the red and white corpuscles in the blood of a single organism. They are unable to obtain even the freedom of the fall. They are unable to choose evil let alone good. In an article last week, I explained very roughly why I think any study of this great modern mistake should begin with what may seem very abstract matters of morals or metaphysics. Briefly, it is because the most practical question of all, the question of which we want, is itself a moral question, and even a metaphysical question. And the next stage of this argument brings us once into practical politics. Given this primary conception of mankind as one machine, it is impossible to consider each man even as a separate machine, let alone a separate man. You cannot take a steam engine or a mortar car to pieces and use the wheels for hoops and the rods for walking sticks. You cannot take a social machine to pieces and use the individuals as complete citizens, let alone Christian souls. And this disregard of the democratic dignity of individuals is obvious in the very language of such social materialists. For instance, they always talk of solidarity rather than of sympathy. The former word has incidental advantages over the latter, of course, including the fact that it is two syllables longer and therefore more suited to go straight to the great heart of the people. But there is also a real difference of meaning. I have sympathy with a great many things with which I cannot or would not be consolidated. I can sympathize with a high-born maiden in a palace tower, soothing her love-laden soul in secret hour with music sweet as love that overflows her bower, if I may again invoke the help of Shelley. But if I were to attempt to achieve solidarity with the young lady at that moment, I might possibly find myself a little de trop. I can sympathize with the child that is happy and lonely and good when the friend of the children comes out of the wood, if I may summon the aid of Stevenson. But if I tried to consolidate all three of us, I might find that two is company and three is none. There is in the word solidarity the sense of something not only homogeneous but amorphous, and this is not a mere matter of sentiment, but very decidedly of system. Behind words like solidarity, there are things much more solid. There is a positive treatment of political questions which separates such men, not merely from the politics of the past, 
but rather specially from the revolutions of the past. The old revolutionists invoked the rights of man, but these revolutionists only invoke the rights of mankind. There is a great practical as well as a great theoretical difference. The neglect of the individual, whom I have symbolized by the solitary maiden or the lonely child, involved very vital innovations when applied logically, and especially when applied legally. The difference between the rights of man and the rights of mankind is anything but a fine shade of academic difference. Mankind, for instance, has a right to food, but its claim to food might take the form of cannibalism. But we are not content to say that mankind has a right to eat. We are also so fanciful as to say that a man has a right not to be eaten. Mankind has a right to labor, to the opportunities and the fruits of labor, but its claim to the fruits of labor might take the form of slavery. We are not content to say that mankind has a right to be supported. We add to it the proviso that a man has the right not to be enslaved. Mankind has a right to truth, and especially to truth in practical problems of law and crime, but its claim to truth might take the form of torture. We are not satisfied with saying that mankind has a right to legal and political truth. We add in our fastidious fashion that a man has the right not to be tortured. As a matter of fact, most human governments, however oppressive, have been more or less consciously affected by this human tradition. They have therefore refrained from putting into practice the full logic of the mere doctrine of the greatest happiness of the greatest number. They have not avowed, they have not often even acted on, the extreme doctrine of the denial of individual dignity. They have seldom assumed that anything could be done to a minority, or that anything could be done to a man. But a new political philosophy, avowedly basing itself on a modern cosmic philosophy, may hold itself free to do all sorts of things in the absence of any definition of individual freedom. The organism may behave very decisively towards its corpuscles, so that at a superficial glance they seem to resemble corpses. Now putting on one side the merely illustrative examples of cannibalism and torture, I propose to devote the third of these articles to the prospect of the new social ideal simply resolving itself into slavery, for that word is the real key to the immediate future of mankind. End of section 43section forty four of g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen twenty one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen twenty one by g k chesterton at the sign of the world's end the escape from equality the only moral attraction of socialism is the ideal of equality or at least the correction of inequality there may be men who like centralization because it will involve officialism and who like officialism because they hope to be the officials but even when they are the officials of a socialist state they will not be socialists their motive is one that could be as well answered in a servile state, and therefore most of them are now almost openly in favor of a servile state. But the motive which makes most honest men socialists is the motive of making a society in which there shall be no masters or slaves, and the moral ideal behind that motive can only be the ideal of equality or the brotherhood of human beings upon the basis of human dignity. It may seem contradictory, but it is also correct to say that while the Marxians must adopt this ideal, it is difficult to see why they do. Materialism and fatalism are the foundations of their creed, and these views are more easily advanced in support of incurable inequality. It may be arguable that the movements of historic humanity can best be explained as those of animals in search of food. It may be that the crusaders marching to a howling wilderness bore a striking resemblance to a flock of sheep trotting towards 
a better grazing ground. It may be that a polar expedition going north is seeking a more agreeable climate like a flock of birds going south. But nothing is more certain than that all sheep do not find equally good grazing grounds. Nothing is more certain that some birds are left behind, some birds fall and perish, and that some birds are killed by other birds. Of course, there is a distinction here. The moral ideal of equality may, for some reason, exist in spite of materialism, but it seems clear that their equality cannot actually come from their materialism. And I confess I am considerably puzzled about where it does come from. An Irish priest, who is a friend of mine, made the only comment on Marxian egalitarianism which seems to me to cover this point about equality. They have taken the most mystical thing in religion without the religion. But when we turn from the abstract to the concrete conception of equality, we find another difficulty. Numbers of people denounce collectivist equality as impossible. But nobody seems to notice that equality is not so much impossible for anybody as particularly impossible for collectivists. The socialist state gives all power to the government, and therefore cuts much deeper than any other government. In practice, the chasm between the governor and the governed. In every society there is the public official and the private citizen. But the number of things that the public official can do to the private citizen is increased and not diminished by the collectivist change. In short, there cannot admittedly be political equality, even if there is economic equality. Even if we have abolished aristocracy and plutocracy, there can still be bureaucracy, and perhaps a particularly bullying bureaucracy. But in truth, this is only the beginning of the practical problem and the singular paradox. I have said that even if it gives us economic equality, it must very markedly refuse us political equality. But in fact, it will not give us economic equality. There is a hitch or trick in the practical process which could have been calculated beforehand, but which in any case always appears afterwards. A sort of catch in the clockwork, even of this clockwork community. Its effect is that even in the purely economic field, equality can be evaded. And its nature can be defined in a single word, familiar to all sorts of people from the highest order of professional prize fighters down to the lowest remnant of wandering lecturers and journalists the secret is in the word expenses if a man always has a motor car to take him about only a fine shade of distinction separates him from the man who always takes his motor car about that fine shade is for us indeed very important but for him it may be as in the present case it may merely be mystical and therefore unreal. The distributist will feel the difference because of the intangible sentiment of property. But the socialist definitely explains that he does not feel or wish to feel the sentiment of property. He does not wish to own things, but only to use or enjoy them. We may therefore safely repeat that if the state permits him to use the motor car, he will probably permit himself to enjoy it and for most people a motor car is very enjoyable. It is for them more enjoyable than walking, and if one man walks and the other man motors, we have already a scene of the straight high road of progress not startlingly dissimilar to what may be seen any day in the crooked lanes of our antiquated and aristocratic land. I take the motor merely as a model, but upon this model all the new inequality is built up. The new officials must travel swiftly, and therefore they will certainly travel smoothly. But it will be found also that everything combines to enable them also to live smoothly. They must have the handling of large sums of money, and a great deal of discretion about it. Especially, as in the case of politicians, the sort of discretion that can cover an indiscretion. They may be regarded as public servants, but they must be in control of a large number of other public servants and these public servants may begin to look rather like private servants. The same will be found true of a hundred details of housing or food or furniture. One of the most tolerant and open-minded men I know, a distinguished war correspondent of strong liberal sympathies, told me that the Russian Revolution had kicked some salt king or other millionaire out of his magnificent mansion, 
which we agreed was quite cheerful and satisfactory, but that the Bolshevist politician was living in this palace exactly as the Salt King had lived in it. My friend had a specially vivid memory of the massive and superb candelabra hanging from the highly decorative roof. It seems a pity it did not fall on the Salt King and smash him, but since it missed its opportunity, it might just as well fall on the socialist official before it is too late. The mention of the Salt King is not unimportant here, for it distinguished this criticism from the ordinary capitalist criticism. And indeed, the ordinary capitalist has no right to criticize. As he himself is not even aiming at equality, he has no claim to denounce the Bolshevists for not arriving at equality. It is illogical for the capitalists to rave and wail over Moscow because it has begun to reproduce capitalism but it certainly has begun to reproduce capitalism. My friend, the war correspondent, is the very reverse of a lover of war. But like many men who combine peaceable opinions and personal courage, he is quite capable of the generous illogicality of being a lover of revolution. He is not naturally disposed to abuse the Bolshevists, not nearly so much as I am. But he told me very positively that a new capitalist class is rising in Russia or in other words that the bureaucracy is capable of becoming also a plutocracy. But although the capitalists have no right to condemn capitalism, we have the right to condemn capitalism, especially when it calls itself socialism, and we have the right to say that such a compromise or amalgamation is more remote from our own ideal than ordinary capitalism itself. And this is so of necessity for the reason with which this argument began, that the official has in any case more official power than the ordinary citizen, or even than the ordinary capitalist. The new system has already sacrificed liberty, before it thus goes on to betray equality. The logical inference would seem to be that the state which set out to establish equality would end as more unequal than those that have aimed at inequality, would end as the most unequal and unjust of all the tyrannies of mankind. So once more, by a process of elimination, we come back to the ideal of distributive democracy. So in this world men frequently try all the odd things before they think of the ordinary thing. In Russia, indeed, it has always been in some rude fashion the ordinary thing, and in some rude fashion is returning to its rights. But in England, about which I care more than for a universe of Russians, it is still counted so extraordinary that this paper appears eccentric in preaching it, and outside this paper it may never be preached again, as men passing in an express train through a great city see only in one green flash a garden or a field amid the blackness of slums and factories. So in this ephemeral publication one glimpse of the everlasting sanity will flash and fade. End of section 44 Section 45 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1921, by G. K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End, Carols and Common Sense The chief constable of Blackpool, presumably alarmed at the belated reaction of ridicule and contempt which met his veto on carol singing, has caused an explanation to be made, or at least attempted. The explanation does not explain what it is meant to explain, but it explains something much more interesting. It unconsciously proclaims the whole principle upon which are founded most of the rules for the regimentation of the poor. The principle is a rather curious one. It is that there is every excuse for somebody doing something fantastic, if he has no sort of need to do it. But it is quite inexcusable if it is in any sense needful. If a man with a thousand a year stands on his head in the street, he does not obstruct the thoroughfare. But if he can earn a night's lodging only by standing on his head, 
then the antic is quite indefensible. The extreme case of this, of course, is the process by which the police first prove that a man has no money for a bed, and then punish him for sleeping out of a bed. But there are milder examples, and this matter of carol singing is one of them. The official phrases were to the effect that there was no intention to interfere with legitimate carol singing, but only to restrain the wickedness of certain unscrupulous parrots, whose fiendish and piratical unscrupulousness consisted in allowing the children they could not feed to sing for pennies. It is a first principle of social reform, of course, that all needy parents are unscrupulous parents, and it is a fact apparent in all political history that there have never been such things as unscrupulous officials. But what concerns us more especially here is the logical principle involved, and it can easily be stated logically. Carol singing is wrong, even when the patron really wants the carol, because the singer really wants the cash. It becomes an unsatisfactory proceeding through being satisfactory to both sides. If the carol singer did not need the payment at all, it would then be permissible to pay him. It would then be legitimate carol singing. When the Earl of Griffin Towers, that high-spirited but somewhat eccentric young aristocrat, and Miss Pansy Pattacake, the fashionable and highly successful comedy actress, feel inclined for a little fun to go round in fancy dress singing carols, it is felt that it would be a great shame to interfere with them, as indeed I quite agree that it would. But because precisely the same act of singing a Christmas carol might possibly help to provide a starving family with a Christmas dinner, the act becomes shamefully unscrupulous. It would be putting it mildly to say that I do not agree with the morality. It would be putting it more correctly to say that I cannot see the meaning of it. But certainly there is a new morality involved, which, unnatural as it seems to me, seems to come natural to many people. And if I am asked, as a general historical question, why I regret the rise of Puritanism and industrialism and scientific officialism, I should be content to say it is because they have produced this moral perversion in otherwise decent people. And if I wanted evidence that another and better morality had once belonged to our country, I could find it in the very form of some of the carols themselves. If anybody asked me how I know that England was once a Christian and a Catholic country, I should answer in eight exceedingly simple lines, to my mind very touching and even intense lines. I quote them from memory, and I am not sure about the exact words of the first. The night was very frosty, my shoes are very thin. I've got a little pocket to put a penny in. And if you haven't got a penny, a halfpenny will do. If you haven't got a halfpenny, God bless you. I know nothing finer in its way than the gesture of Christian irony and courtesy with which in the last line the patron is himself admitted to the high aristocracy of the destitute. But not only has this new morality strangled all sorts of sane and generous things in sentiment but it has tangled itself up in a knot of impossibilities in practical reasoning the chief constable admits that there is nothing illegitimate about carol singing but he says that some parents are unscrupulous because they allow children to indulge in it when in the particular circumstances it is bad for the particular children but it is self-evident that this applies quite as well to half a hundred other things, and to almost any circumstances of almost any children. Somebody must decide whether it is bad for Polly's health to go to dances, and an unscrupulous parent might turn it into a dance of death. The point is that the chief constable cannot intervene except by forbidding dancing, and then explaining that he did not quite mean what he said. Somebody must decide whether it makes Tommy vain to be so often photographed, and an unscrupulous parent might so persistently require him to look pleasant that he grew up decidedly unpleasant. But the point is that the chief constable cannot possibly do anything in the matter, except simply punish people for taking photographs, and then vaguely assure us that he did not mean to do the only thing that he can do. Any sane person ought to be able to see in a flash 
from the first the truisms that underlie the whole question that you cannot prevent personal questions being personal and that you certainly cannot lay down impersonal rules about them and then try to make your own rules indecisive as well as impersonal some person must decide whether any given child at any given time may safely dance or pose to a camera or sing a carol he may be an unscrupulous person in which case we can only do our best to modify his influence with the personal influence of more scrupulous persons but somebody must be roughly responsible for these small daily decisions and the attempt to make the community collectively responsible for them is rank raving insanity there may be an unscrupulous parent as there may be an unscrupulous policeman but the policeman cannot take charge of all the babies in the parish and the parents can so far from the question of whether a child should go carol singing represents a dilemma or difference of opinion which stands equal for high and low any parents in any class may have to balance the choice of christmas festivity against the chances of winter cold many parents in all classes are unduly confident or criminally careless about it many children in all classes may die of christmas parties and christmas games but the presence of the chief constable of blackpool at the christmas party will not bar the doors against death in the case of the poor however there is a further consideration the most obvious of all and the most neglected of all rich or poor may rush recklessly upon evil but the poor are generally confronted from the first with a choice of evils the unscrupulous parent has to consider not whether it is bad for little tommy to sing in the snow but whether it is worse for little tommy to sing in the snow than it is for little sally to go to the fourth day without a penny worth of milk tommy's shoes may be very thin and yet not be so thin as sally the chief constable is not going to provide the milk he is not going to improve the shoes he is only going to forbid the carol and he is actually going to forbid it because it is not useless but useful because it is not needless but necessary because it is not only a tradition of love and laughter but also a matter of life and death such is modern sociology such is its morality such is its mentality such its quality of intelligence but in truth it adds to its stupidity and its cruelty another moral characteristic without which the whole would not be a rounded and perfect thing it would break up the balance of a fine sentence in the litany if there were not present pride in hypocrisy as well as blindness and hardness of heart we may safely say of some of our most advanced social idealists that they are doing something else besides fussing and meddling and bullying they are also lying they are giving a false reason for their acts and one that is worse than false because it is hypocritical that is that it covers the presence of a human motive with the pretense of a heroic motive the human motive for getting rid of carol singers is the same as that for getting rid of beggars it is perfectly natural and in some cases almost inevitable but it is a natural or inevitable irritation it is simply that such things are a nuisance it is that they are a discomfort but especially a discomfort to the comfortable it is as clear as daylight to anybody with the least common sense that this order is simply the last command sent out by that formidable league mentioned in the path to rome the society for the prevention of annoyances to the rich nor will any humane person necessarily be annoyed with the rich for being annoyed any more than he is annoyed with the poor for being annoying a certain amount of such nervous friction is normal to all mortal life anywhere where the rich are wrong is in taking their own annoyance seriously and where they are horribly and hellishly wrong is in taking it sanctimoniously i do not even object to the displaying their anger what i object to is their disguising their anger masking it in moral pretensions that will not bear a moment's examination and in sociological arguments that do not even make sense compared with this intellectual degradation irritation itself is incomparatively intelligent 
nerves are better than nonsense and the sensibility that shudders at a false note in music is at least truer than the truth of things than the insensibility that does not shudder at the most hideous and suicidal false steps in logic if therefore the luxurious aesthete is concerned to save his soul let him not so much guard against losing his temper as in the true sense losing his reason let him keep at the back of his mind at least a sense of proportion and of the balance of the universe let him consider that if some things are bad other things are worse and that half a carol singer is better than no christmas i have said that the poor are commonly confronted with a choice of evils in this matter we may say that the rich are confronted with a choice of evils too at any rate if a man of the comfortable sort comes to be confronted with such a choice of evils there should be no doubt about what his choice should be if the weights besiege his house suddenly and there seems no other way then if he retain anything of christian charity and chivalry let him hurl oaths and curses and other heavy objects from the window let him empty a water jug or fire off a gun but if he wishes to be branded with the seal of the pomp of satan let him say he is concerned with the interests of infantile hygiene end of section forty five end of g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen twenty one by g k chesterton